What is up, everybody, and welcome back to the Season 7 Finals. I am your host, Justin Kruger, community developer on Rainbow Six Siege, and we are about to reveal Operation Parabellum, Year 3, Season 2 operation that takes place in Italy. This crowd is hyped to hear all the information that is coming in Season 2, and to help me break this down, please keep that excitement going for my amazing panelists, Jeremy Dow... Dowsett, level designer on Rainbow Six Siege, and Alexander Carpazes, presentation director on Rainbow Six Siege. Please give a big round of applause. <laughs> Jeremy, how's it going, man? I'm doing pretty good, buddy. How are you? Doing great. You enjoying yourself at the finals? I'm loving it. It's, it's tense. And uh, you're, this is the first time on a panel, as well as Alex. It's your first time, too. Alex, how are you? I'm loving it. It's amazing. Yesterday, today, the matches are incredible. The matches are incredible. This crowd has been incredible. We love you guys. Yeah, we thank love you. you so much. And thank you to everybody tuning in on Twitch, YouTube, Mixer, across the board uh, on all the, all the streaming channels for Operation Parabellum. We're really excited to get into Operation Parabellum. Of course, coming with Operation Parabellum, we have two new defending operators and a new map villa. And let's start off with that new map villa, Jeremy. Let's break it down. How would you describe Villa for the people. Villa is the kind of place you'd want to go on vacation if you're in Italy. It's a beautiful, massive villa, vineyards, beautiful vistas. It's it's lovely. It's picturesque. It's, it's, it's exactly what you would think a villa in the countryside of Italy would look exactly. like. Exactly. It's just really pretty. And it's, you know, it's the, the art team did a really great job. But as per usual, with anything that's rainbow, there's a darker side to it. The family has been forging and selling art. And Alibi was there undercover a long time ago, and Rainbow's coming in to put a stop to it. As always, there's a, a beautiful side. This this map looks gorgeous, but there is chaos and destruction and uh, a lot of things going on on this map. How does it play? The map plays really well balanced. Uh, when I went through and started designing this map, it was made to go ranked and to go pro straight away. Um, so uh, there's a lot of focus on navigation and flow and viability of the bomb sites. And it's, it is one of the most competitive maps. You're, you, you built it this way. You worked on this from the ground up. Yes. Where did you start when designing this map? I started with a pen and paper in 2D. I'd just go and look at the silhouette of the building and how it's going to look overall in just the world. And then I'd go through and start mocking out where I want to put corridors, rooms, you know, and the flow from outside to inside. And I go through and I start mocking it, mocking it up bit by bit, just on paper. And then I rough in the bomb sites, think about it, do a few iterations, and I go straight through and I just start building it, and then we start playing it straight away. Right, so you start off with old school pen and paper. That's that's really old school, Jeremy. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm an old man, what do you want? <laughs> You've been uh, designing levels uh, in this industry for a very long time. Uh, and uh, it, you, you always start off with that pen and paper. That's something that you, you design. And from that, you iterate, you build it in 3D, you create different uh, designs from it out of that. And then you create this flow and you test this flow and you make it competitive in a way that, that feels good as a game, as, a, as, a, as, as an experience. It's, it's iteration and learning as you go. You really need to just look at it, look at the angles, look where the doors are, look where the windows are, and look at the rotations that can possibly happen from the design. And that's one of the great things about being a level designer is you can just go through and if it doesn't work, you can just erase it and start again. And you know, there's been a lot of different versions of this map. Very early on when we started playtest with the pros, um, the pros liked it, they loved it. They were like, okay, this is gonna be a good map. There was one bomb site that wasn't really that viable, but I just went through and re we reworked it and actually just made it just that much better. It was, um, you know, a couple of days worth of work and then all four bomb sites are viable and it just go and keep going. You know, if it doesn't work, 
Let's start again. So through these play tests, you, you tweak it, you work it, you rework it, maybe change a few things. Uh, and they felt as though this was very competitive. Uh, we, you've been talking about how it's a competitive map. What makes it so competitive? I believe the reason why it's so competitive is because of the viability one of the bomb sites and the rotation possibilities on the bomb sites. And then when you add in the destruction of this map and how many walls are destructible, it's you can open up a bomb site, you can open up an avenue to attack, you can shut down avenues as defense. It's it takes a long time, but we went through it and we just got it perfect and you know it's going ranked so it's great yeah it's going in ranked of course and uh it is being considered for the pro the upcoming pro league as well which is really exciting so let's break down some of the strategy that is going to be seen or potentially seen on this new map and let's start with the tactical view of the attackers and where they're they're going to spawn so let's take a quick look at that um so here is the outside you have three main entrances the main entrance the fountain and the ruins or th three spawns you have three spawns uh main entrance you can go through and this map's a little bit different there's actually safe ish entrances to the basement so safe ish safe ish <laughs> like, there's nothing safe in rainbow Road. right exactly so from the main entrance you can go through stellar into the basement from um ruins you can go through the side and then go through to the crypt entrance and same from the fountain so you've got three really great spawn points and three really great avenues just to get to the building it's and when you see it, it's easy to call out, and it's really nice, and the paths are really good and quite, w quite well balanced. So you've been talking a lot about the inside the building, so let's take a look inside the building. Let's go inside and break down the defenders' uh, uh, points with their bomb sites as well. Uh, and let's start off with the first floor, and let's take a look at the two bomb sites on the first floor. Uh, on the first floor, we do have kitchen dining and lounge library. Let's start off with that first bomb site, kitchen dining room. What's the strategy that we're gonna be seeing on that, Jeremy? Kitchen dining is really interesting because just at the back of the kitchen, there's a set of stairs that go down through the pantry into the basement. So you've got a really fast rotate that allows you to go through basement, back up and out, and there's hatches as well. Um, what's different with this map is we actually don't have any exterior access to any bomb sites. So you always have to go through a room. You have to commit to the bomb site. You can't just jump through a window, plant, and run away. Yeah, and as we're going to be seeing in this bird's eye uh, uh, overview, you're, you are going to see a lot of buffer rooms. Is, what's the design intention behind buffer rooms? The reason for the buffer rooms is because we want the team to commit to the plant. We don't want them just to jump in and then go far back and like hold their plant from a long distance. We want them to have to stick around and actually try and defend it. And that's the reason why we did it, just to make it way more viable and more competitive. And uh, you know, w when our earlier talks about this map, there was actually one of those entry points that became just way too uh, uh, easy to access the bomb site. But you guys changed that. Oh no, we, we flat out changed it. Kitchen dining, um, it was a little bit too easy to get into the bomb site from um, the fountain. So we changed it, added a few different paths and a few more destructible walls and just locked it down to make it way more viable than it actually um, was at that time. But that's the, beauty, that's the beauty of having the pros come in and actually have their feedback and even you know high ranked players come in and play. Cool, so let's stay on the first floor here and take a look at the second bomb site which is Lounge Library. Tell us a little bit about Lounge Library, Jeremy. Lounge Library is super interesting, as you see in that in info. Um, in the lounge, there's this little nook that you think is the best like best place to go and hide. A little nook and cranny? Little nook and cranny. <laughs> but just behind, the, if you don't reinforce the walls behind that nook, then you're just completely open for like someone shooting through the wall. You have to remember that between the first floor and the second floor, it's completely line of sight. Everything's destructible apart from the top of the stairs. So it's really easy to defend and attack um, a bomb site from above if you really want to. So, and that, that line of sight floor is really going to become crucial, crucial for defending these or even uh, uh, attacking these because you can put pressure on the defenders uh, from that site. As we've seen a lot on a map like Border that does have one of those line of sight floors. We saw that a lot this weekend where people are pushing through that or even defending through that as well it's it's one of it's one of the great things to see the strategies that come out when the maps are actually released and the same thing when this comes out on the test server on tuesday um it's, i'm going to be really interested and i'm going to be watching how people play it and that line of sight floor is going to be key especially if you're attacking these bomb sites absolutely key so that is a look at the first floor let's take a look at the second floor and the two bomb sites that we have there are aviator games and trophy room and statue room 
Jeremy, let's uh, break down this first bomb site here, which is the aviator room and the games room. The games room and the aviator room is really fun. The, the bomb sites are actually adjacent just for a breakable wall, but there's also a rotation path through a vault where you see um, you see the hammer on the wall. Oh, that's that's where we see the sledge's hammer in the in the beautiful case uh, yeah. that you might have seen in the teasers yeah, or something like that. It's up on the wall. The art, the art guys love to just put stuff, <laughs> stuff in the map. There's, there's a lot of Easter eggs I've noticed in this map. There is yeah. a number of Easter eggs. Um, it'd be interesting to see how long it takes the community to find them all, actually. Um, but what's really interesting is the bomb sites are adjacent to each other with a breakable wall, and there's really fast rotates, and you're in close proximity to red stairs, and you're also in close proximity to the um, main stairs from the main entrance. So the opportunity for um, rotations on all of the bomb sites is brilliant. And that's one of the main key aspects of this map is the rotations uh, that are going to be really crucial. It brings in a lot of strategy as well. It, it's it's going to be key for teams is communication and how they're going to rotate on and off of the sites. I, even when you're attacking, how you're going to rotate. And there's so many viable options for rotations on this map, it's kind of mind-boggling. And uh, as we're seeing here, there's a lot of destructibility too. <laughs> yeah, there's a, with, this, with the new um, auto shotgun, um, you can just take walls out. It's like you can just open up flank paths and just Destroy Italy gets destroyed <laughs> um, on a daily basis when we're playing it. And it's, it's really always interesting. And, and again, when I start building the map, I start with all of the walls being destroyable, and then I start taking them out mm. to, to balance the sites and to balance the flow. That's really interesting. And now uh, you mentioned rotation, and let's take a look at the second bomb site on the second on the second floor, which is trophy and statue. There's a really key part of this uh, bomb site that uh, I'll allow you to talk about. Yeah, this one's really this one's really interesting. It's actually my favorite bomb site. It's because the bombs are across an alcove um, across the red um, the red corridor. So basically, you can fight across the alcove, which is really interesting. You're super close to the astronomy room, which allows you to get downstairs to the main red corridor again. But you can always just vault over the um, over the railing straight into the red corridor. There's also a breakable wall at the end where you can break the wall and try and control the red corridor from above. But it's it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to achieve. And yeah, and, and we're taking a look at that alcove right now, uh, or just a few moments ago. Uh, that that becomes a really critical point of chaos and tension. Uh, but it also is allows for strategy with the rotation as well. Even if you have a bomb site on the fr first floor, or maybe even especially if you have a bomb site on that first floor, and you're defending or attacking from that second floor, that's a quick way down. Uh, to push the site. It's it's super fast and it's quick for anyone to get through and rotate. Obviously in the bedroom there's um, a hatch you can blow as well but there's also the other thing is there's the skylight and if you're feeling brave you can try and attack the bomb site from the skylight. We saw a really good skylight play there in the the last map uh, that, that was where it was amazing. bomb rest just, yeah, yeah it was just, ama just amazing. incredible. Uh, so that is uh, the first floor and the second floor broken down. Let's take a look at the basement. The basement is really crucial for many different reasons, uh, especially because there's no bomb. There's no bomb site there, um, but it comes into play. Uh, it, it really becomes a, a crucial point. Why is it so important? It's really important because it's key for the rotations. Because you've got the main stairs, the pantry stairs, the red stairs. Um, you've got this is where you're going to rotate through all of the time. That's also where you're going to enter from because if you come through the crypt tunnel or you come through the cellar tunnel you're coming through to those massive wine barrels as you're seeing on screen now and you're entering through through the barrels and as soon as you blow that you're giving away your position but you can also just come through the garage which you know you're not going to make any noise it's just a door there but what's really funny is you see the hatches in the ceiling and you see and you see all of the um, stairways and all the ways to go so when you're when you're defending kitchen dining you're gonna you're gonna rotate through this when maybe if you're up in um, statue trophy you, you need a quick rotate you might end up coming back through and up around and it allows for really good flanking paths so it's a really viable way for the attackers to push in it, meaning that the defenders may have to have one roamer down in the basement or uh, or even really just keep an eye on that especially if they're on that first floor and they don't want to get pressured too too early from the basement uh, that's going to be pretty pretty key. The map's pretty. The map is roamer friendly. That's for sure. Roamer friendly map, <laughs> but it's tense. Like, it's I, tense. Know, right. I, I know. I know the map like the back of my hand. I've been doing building it for eight nine months now, and you know I'm surprised by the, the different ways that I get killed almost on a daily basis in this map. 
uh, just different ways of getting kills, a lot of angles, a lot of destructibility. That is uh, a really amazing map, and I cannot wait for players to get their hands on this map. And you'll be able to play Villa for the very first time on the test ser servers starting May 22nd, which is Tuesday. Yeah, it's Tuesday. It's, it's so short. So close. Yeah. I'm super excited. Fans here are really excited. I'm, I'm, I'm glad the fans like it. It's going to be so yeah. much fun. They're finally going to be able to play your baby Villa. Oh, it's, uh, it's released yeah. into the wild. Now I get nervous because I don't know, you know, the rainbow community is great and it's very polarizing. They're either going to love it or hate it. I always say it's like Marmite, you know, <laughs> you love or hate it. And I'm hoping the community really likes it because I had a lot of fun. The production team had a lot of fun building this. You know, hats off to the entire production team in Montreal because I think we pulled off a really great competitive map. Awesome. Well, that is a look at Villa, but that is not everything that is coming in Operation Parabellum, of course. We also have our two new operators, Maestro and Alibi. They are defense <laughs> operators. The crowd here is hyped to take a look at the, them for the very first time. Uh, and of course, Operation Chimera may have favored the attack side, but Operation Parabellum will favor the defense. Let's take a quick look at the UB blog video breaking down these two operators. The new Villa map coming to Rainbow Six Siege in Operation Parabellum may look like a nice spot to relax. But attackers will need to be on high alert to deal with the devious gadgets that the two new defending operators from the Italian CTU are putting into play. One of the most important skills in Siege is spotting your enemies before they spot you. But what if your enemy wasn't your enemy? Say hello to Alibi and Alibi and alibi and alibi only one of them is your opponent the rest are holographic decoys alibi can throw her three decoys anywhere but they'll only deploy if they have the space they can't hurt you but if you shoot them or touch them your position will be compromised immediately and you'll be marked repeatedly for the next few seconds which is bad you're exposed watch out for decoys pretending to spawn peek and decoys pretending to hold angles Watch out for decoys that used to be decoys, but are now just alibi, pretending to be a decoy. Doing any damage to the base of the decoy will destroy it. And as long as you don't shoot or touch the hologram while doing it, you won't be marked. Twitch is an especially good decoy hunter. Thatcher can disrupt them for a bit, and Glaz's sight won't be fooled. You can also keep an eye out for visual discrepancies. The decoy always wears Alibi's default clothing and wields her Storm SMG without any attachments. So if you see Alibi wielding the new ACS-12 shotgun, you'll know she's the real deal. So what happens if Alibi chucks a decoy outside? Well, like a defender who runs outside, the decoy gets marked. But marks are different when Alibi's in the match because they don't reveal the operator's identity. So a decoy deployed outside and a defender that runs outside will look the same unless the attacker can actually see them with their eyes. Though the decoy's mark expires after 10 seconds, that's 10 seconds with a lot of opportunity for mischief. And mischief just might be Alibi's most effective weapon. By making you doubt your own eyesight and second guess your own reflexes, Alibi gets in your head and that's not where you want a defender to be. Five seconds remaining. Now, we all know how powerful cameras are in Siege, but the second new defender, Maestro, is equipped with cameras that are a new kind of powerful. Behold the evil eye. It's bulletproof. It can see through smoke. It shoots a freaking laser beam. Maestro can plant his evil eyes on floors or walls just like Jaeger does with his ABS. And once installed, they're hard to get rid of. Bullets or melee hits won't work. You'll need to use explosives, or destroy the surface it's planted on, or call in your old pal Sledge for a quick demo job. Thatcher and Twitch can disable them temporarily, but as long as the shutter is closed, evil eyes are free to be used as cameras by anyone on the defending team. 
They can mark targets and they can see through smoke. So you'd better be sure there isn't one watching when you rappel in through a courtyard roof opening and try to plant the diffuser. But the evil eye doesn't just spectate. When Maestro is using one and aims down sights, the shutter will slide open to expose a laser. Once the shutter is completely open, Maestro can fire the laser to destroy drones, blow up breach charges, and damage attacking operators. A single shot may not do a lot of damage, but you can fire in rapid succession, and this can be very dangerous for an attacker with low health. Deploy in a good spot, and you can quickly land a bunch of shots before your enemy zeroes in on you, or you overheat the laser. When the shutter is open, the evil eye is vulnerable to gunfire and melee attacks. And remember that the laser won't interrupt a diffuser plant. It's up to Maestro and his LMG or ACS-12 shotgun to clear the room. If you seek dastardly new gadget strategies, prepare for Operation Parabellum. And to keep up with the latest in Rainbow Six Siege, visit us at news.ubisoft.com and subscribe to the Ubisoft YouTube channel. Thank you to Chris Waters for breaking down those operators and giving us a, a brief glimpse at the upcoming Operation uh, Parabellum. Alex, I'd like to bring you in now. Uh, please uh, allow us to break down these operators a little bit further, a little bit more in detail. Let's because, do it. Yeah, because there's a lot to unpack in that yep. video. Uh, and let's start off with Alibi. Uh, who is Alibi? Let's get, get to know her. Sure. Uh, her personality is someone who's very stoic and uh, reserved. Her background is she immigrated to Italy at a young age. Uh, then she grew up, joined law enforcement, and succeeded there. She joined GIS and actually went undercover uh, in operations for them. And that's really where she kind of learns her tricks of the trade, deception, uh, manipulation, uh, the mind games, and that translates right to the gameplay. Yeah, and uh, speaking of her gameplay, she has an, uh, comes equipped with an amazing gadget. Yes. This is one of the most unique gadgets I've ever seen in Rainbow Six Siege, this holographic image of herself. Uh, how does she play? Yeah, so she is a trickster, and she's a bit of a hybrid uh, character where she roams, she places, uh, they're called prismas, These she gets three of these decoys to plant around, um, and then it's all about counterintelligence, it's pretending where you are when you're not actually there, or um, misleading the enemy team into thinking uh, you're in many places at once. And as we saw with Maestro, he is a true form of intelligence gathering that's right but alibi kind of falls in this middle ground where she's not technically a trap operator but she's not technically an intel operator uh, but she has these counter counter intel abilities yeah there's a duality to that and also she can receive intel if you happen to shoot her decoy or drone through the decoy or even throw it outside and to pre pretend to be your DK exactly. decoy as we saw in that that's I mean th those are really interesting strategies that we've seen uh, in, in your play test uh, in while designing this operator what what did you feel uh, in in you know what, what was the vision behind it um, it was really about making the team second guess what you're doing at any given time so uh, we actually found that her decoy is hugely uh, successful with beginner players and even expert players. Yeah, and so that psychology, let's break that down a little bit further because I think that's really important that we discuss that psychology a little bit. From the day one yeah. of Siege, we are taught to aim for the head, <laughs> shoot, and, and be have really lightning fast reactions, especially on, on a pro scene stage like this. Yep. Now we're asking players to change that a little bit, or maybe not change it, but second guess themselves. And that's what's great about her. She introduces this kind of hesitation or doubt, and that means that Alibi can capitalize on that. Capitalize on it and create different strategies like we're seeing here, where it was, uh, you know, you, we have that house, house of mirrors strategy, which is just so, so much fun, where you can deploy all three Alibis and, uh, and kind of just like, 
mess around with yep. the, have the, fun with the, that. The, the it's really annoying for an attacker to kind of pin down the right alibi. What do you think is the best uh, strategy you've seen with alibi? Uh, the House of Mirrors one is really great. There's also ways to synergize with her. Um, so you plant a shield in front of her gadget to protect the base. Uh, maybe people have to jump through to disable it and they fall into a frost trap, or there's a capkin trap. There's a lot of ways to synergize with the defense So while team. she may not be a, a true trap operator, she has a lot of synergies with trap operators, and she has a lot of synergies with the whole team in general, because uh, she does have that unique passive when she deploys a gadget outside of the uh, uh, outside of the defender's boundaries. That's right, actually the passive is shared to the entire team, so anybody who runs outside of a map location won't be immediately identified, so you can pretend to be alibi or actually throw her gadget out there and it'll be an unidentified uh, operator. Yeah, so ma really making uh, the defense have an opportunity to be aggressive. Super aggressive, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, we may see plays where we haven't seen uh, them before, M may see strategies with the out outside and the out of bounds areas becoming these more crucial areas. That's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool, so that is a uh, quick look at Alibi, and as we saw, see in these videos, she comes equipped with a crazy loadout, Alex. Yep. Uh, please uh, tell us a little bit about her loadout, because uh, you know she is a, a roamer yeah. uh, at, at heart as well. So uh, break down the loadout for us. Uh, so her signature weapon is a Storm SMG. So this is a high rate of fire, low damage, but fairly good accuracy which means she's deadly in um, in most distances. And as we're seeing, uh, she's uh, three speed, one one uh, armor. That's right, yeah. so it helps her with mobility, it helps her set up before a match, place all of her gadgets and start roaming and getting that intel on the team. And w what about her second primary? Uh, she actually has, the, for the first time in the game, a shotgun pistol, uh, which is hilarious and a lot of fun, and it actually synergizes well with her kit. You can make some uh, peeking holes that you can set the gadget behind and kind of fool people into thinking she's peeking. Yeah, and one thing that we should note here that there are speed changes coming with Operation Parabellum. So uh, with the uh, three speeds and the one speed, there's uh, a few things changing. Right, so three speeds are going to be a little bit slower and one speeds are going to be a little bit faster. Um, but if you do have a secondary pistol equipped, you will gain a little bit of a speed boost, which means you could see an alibi with a shotgun pistol run at your face. <laughs> it's going to be cool. That, that's really scary. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little frightened, uh, uh, including since she's going to have like three of, of herself around the map as well. So It's going to be terrifying. It's going to be a little bit terrifying. Uh, but to counter that terrif terrifying aspect of al Alibi, who would you say are her best counterpicks? Uh, well, she does use a gadget, so you all see there's IQ who can spot it out. Uh, when you have Twitch, you can destroy it easily with the Twitch drone, and even a Thatcher EMP will disable it temporarily. Um, one of the hardest counters is uh, Glaz, uh, of course. He'll be able to see through any of the decoys, and only the real alibi will light up. Yeah, so if you do have uh, you know, a, a glass peeking at, 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 or somebody uh, on defense trying to rush out, yep. you will have glass a, as an advantage there. to Because that's a really aggressive move. It is. Uh, you know, you, I, it would be hard to really pull that off. But also, as we're seeing with Thatcher, it temporarily disables uh, yep. the, the, uh, the um, decoy, so it's not a full hard counter but a little bit of a soft counter just right. to know if, if she is doing that house of mirrors, house of mirrors trick <laughs> yeah clears the room a bit clears the room uh wh what would you say is the best way to counter her um honestly if you get a super aggressive alibi who's kind of roaming and playing like a, a run out glass is going to be able to shut that, that down immediately yeah Sh shut her down obviously see see the outline of the true alibi yep. and uh, not get deceived Right. Cool. So that is a look at Alibi. And now let's take a look at the Maestro. <laughs> I love him so much. Uh, Maestro is a very charismatic leader. Um, he has a bit of history with Alibi. He joined the GIS. After that, he went solo and ran his own boot camp. So he's a natural leader, a natural teacher. Uh, and now he's with, and he's with Rainbow Six. Uh, he's a great operator to kind of hunker down and protect a point. And he just looks cool. Man, this guy has so much charm. <laughs> I'm jealous. I love yeah. it. As we saw also, uh, if you're following on Twitter, uh, Kassan Milos 
yep. just cosplayed as uh, as as Maestro and nailed it. He yeah. just nailed it. That's really awesome. I'm, one I'm to excited one. to see more cosplay of uh, of of Maestro out there. But let's get into his gameplay. How does he play? Yeah, so um, his gadget is the evil eye, and he gets two of these. So these are turrets that he can place around the um, around the map. And you, and you can place them uh, anywhere, or just like Jaeger, you can put it on the floor, you can put it on the uh, on the walls, and um, then you can use it as a camera. It's um, it can see through smoke, and it is bulletproof. But when you open up the visor, you can actually shoot some lasers. Shoot some lasers, and th those lasers only deal about five damage per shot. Right? It's low damage, and even though it's continuous, you can overheat it, so you can't just hold down and wait. So there is a little bit of a balance to it. Exactly, and when you're shooting the laser, it means that your six, uh, your you can actually be destroyed by bullets. Right. So so it's a little bit of a high risk, high reward exactly. there if you are trying to stop that bomb plan or trying to get, just harass people yeah. or uh, just shoot people in the butt like I do with Twitch, <laughs> that is a possibility. Yes, yeah, it is. Absolutely. Um, so he he's sort of defined as a true anchor. What, yeah. uh, what makes him an anchor? Um, well, he gives a lot of intel on a plant site. So you want to be able to position both your cameras on both plant sites or at least uh, destroy enough so you get that vision and you can start uh, giving that intel to your team. Um, and, and he has he has a few similarities to like an echo, for example. He has that stopping power, he has that he has that intel. Uh, would would you say he plays like an echo, like a smoke or he's actually in that same family of being able to stall. So if you see a plant going down, essentially if an attacker walks into uh, a room and sees the camera, they're gonna have to take care of it. Otherwise, you know that Maestro is feeding information about what you're doing. Feeding information, potentially even stopping that plant. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think I, I've even seen uh, some strategies where people will have two maestro cameras set up and they'll just hop back and forth between you them. You can be so annoying with that, it's great. <laughs> so annoying. So he's even also can even even fall into a, a harasser category as exactly, well. Exactly, yeah. Uh, in a similar way that Twitch can kind of do a, a variety of things, maestro is going to be really cr crucial in various aspects. Yeah, he has um, a lot of utility. Yeah, especially if there is, if they are kind of pushing uh, from the top side or defending from uh, the top side on Villa as well, they can uh, have a maestro set up in, in, the, in the second floor or in, even in the basement, just keep an eye on things. That's cool, maestro, maestro actually plays really well in Villa, he, pl he plays really well in uh, lot of maps actually, like I played, I played with him an awful lot and I played with Alibi an awful lot, but Maestro, yeah, in Maestro plus Villa, yeah, that's, it's a fun. that's a fun time. <laughs> plus the Italians are, are equipped with these these uh, just explosive power and 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 brute force yep. to destroy this uh, entire um, uh, you know this entire beautiful villa that you worked so hard on. Uh, it's 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 a real shame. Um, but I don't design for operators because you don't want anything to be OP. So the first time I was actually playing and I heard that auto shotgun, I was really wondering what it was. And I'm like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> and I was busy building the map, and this wall just disappeared in front of me. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> this is. Oh, that is Maestro. Yeah, this is real now. Yeah, and speaking of that auto shotgun, let's take a look at his uh, loadout really quick here. Yeah. Um, uh, after we we take we cut back from this gameplay, but his loadout is pretty interesting. It is. He has a lot of utility and can be built different ways. He is a three armor, one speed, so he's pretty beefy. So he's a thick boy. He is. And Another thick boy in Rainbow Six. We've given him uh, a lot of tools to, to play around with that. So, like you said, he's really about brute force when it comes to his loadout. He has an LMG, um, and because he is a one speed, uh, you can put an ACOG on that if you want. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can hear a reaction coming from the crowd here. I Alex. can't wait to see it. Can't that wait is, to see uh, it. That's going to be really interesting, especially. Uh, he is, you know, the, the one speeds are getting a little bit of that speed boost, so they're not as handicapped as they were before. Right. With that ACOG, we may see a few uh, spawn peaks or, it could or be. run out. It could be, but then again, you want to have your Maestro alive for as long as possible to anchor down. So Right, we'll he doesn't have a, a really great passive. Yeah. Because while the cameras are, are useful, yep. they can be useful, the true 
utility of it comes with the laser. Exactly. So if he runs out and dies, then you're you're kind of defeating the purpose of having Maestro on the team. Right. Um, yeah, and, and as we see with with Pick and Band being introduced into the Pro League, that's going to be m way more crucial in, in, in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. On the flip side, his other primary is that full auto shotgun we've been seeing a lot, um, and it can delete walls and floors. It's pretty crazy, and that also works really well, giving him a lot of uh, line of sights with his cameras. Line of sights with his cameras, just opening up walls, being able to create the environment that Maestro wants to live in. <laughs> he thrives in. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. He's the kind of guy that's just like, I don't like this wall. <laughs> Goodbye. It's gone. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I can see that, yeah. It's gone. <laughs> it's just gone. Sorry, Jer Jeremy it just cries a tear every oh. time Maestro deletes a wall. There's so much destruction in Italy, and as soon as he turns off, everything just goes away. <laughs> but it's good fun. And he also has that um, revolver shotgun, too. So he can just with. create more halls. Yep. Just two shotguns, let's go. Yeah, It'll be absolutely. fun. absolutely. So that's really awesome. I'm really excited to see... Uh, Maestro in action, uh, but who would you say are his counter picks? Um, again, it is a gadget, so you'll see the same kind of counters as you will with Alibi. You have um, IQ, you can spot them out. Uh, you'll have Twitch and Thatcher who can disable it temporarily, um, which is incredibly useful, but of course you want to destroy it too, so you do have Sledge that can just run up and smash it. Yeah, he can, he can just smash it, which makes sense. It does. You know, it just, it just logically, it's yeah. just like he has a sledgehammer, this is a camera, it's gonna be gone. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I really love that. Uh, but also, we, you know, we mentioned Echo, we mentioned Smoke, we mentioned the pick and bands. Yeah. Do you feel as though Maestro is a good alternative uh, to those? Because if there is a pick and band in pick and band, you could potentially see a map without a Smoke or without an echo, and that means that Maestro could be picked alongside that. Exactly. He, he can either be a good alternative, or actually, um, if those options aren't taken off the table with the band system, he can synergize really well to create this super stall uh, composition. Yeah, and there's also one that we haven't touched on too, which is Dokubi. Dokubi, yes. She can pop into the camera. She can't use the laser, but she can use his camera. She can use his cameras, yeah. which is, ah, uh, man, that is, <laughs> that is really exciting. It is. That is really exciting. Um, great. So, that is a look at Maestro and Alibi and Villa. That is really exciting. Yeah. But... There is way more coming with Operation Parabellum, because if you want customization items, we got customization items. Uh, we have two BDUs that are arriving with Operation Parabellum, uh, one for Alibi and one for Maestro. These are head-to-toe customizations that uh, do come with the year pass, so if you do have own the year three season pass, they, you will get these right off the bat day one. So if you want a fancy-looking Alibi or fancy-looking Maestro, on day one, you can have that. Additionally, <laughs> drum roll, please. <laughs> we have a new elite to show off that I don't think has been leaked yet. Oh, <laughs> don't think so. <laughs> that elite is the Thatcher elite. That's right. This elite skin comes equipped with a MVP victory animation winning screen. Comes equipped, obviously, with a weapon skin, a charm, and a Thatcher face reveal. A good-looking face reveal. Yeah, a good-looking face reveal. He's face. a good-looking man. He's a nice He's like guy. a rugged, I'm gonna mess shit up guy. <laughs> yeah, that is, a, that is a really cool look at, at uh, Thatcher's elite skin. I can't wait for that. I'm, I'm just like, I'm like, this is awesome. You know, we so, so often in Siege that our operators are behind a smoke mask or... <laughs> some other kind of mask, and we don't get to see their, their face. Their and, lovely face. And Thatcher looks pretty cool. Great. Uh, so we do have a ton, a ton more coming with Operation Parabellum that will be arriving on uh, May 22nd on the test servers. You do not want to miss out on some of this stuff that we're about to cover as well. Uh, let's break down some of the new features that are coming in. Let's start off with the new secondary gadget, the bulletproof camera. Yeah. Uh, this camera is obviously comes equipped on six defensive operators and was in one of our test servers before. Uh, it kind of looks a little bit like Maestro's uh, camera, but you can't move when you're in it. Uh, how does how else does it differ? 
Um, it can see through uh, smoke like his camera can, um, but it can be destroyed in a number of different ways. It can be shot from the side, um, and it can be meleeed as well. So uh, there's a couple of different options you can do to take it out. A couple of different options. Obviously, it is a gadget, so those uh, those gadget destroying abilities do yep. counter it as well. Um, but a really interesting uh, secondary gadget that's coming to six operators. So that that will be really interesting to see. Uh, you know how that changes a few different things. Alongside of that, we since we have a new secondary camera, we have a new primary camera yeah. with a, a unique gadget. We have to introduce a uh, new observation tool as well. And Echo also is getting a second Echo drone with Operation Parabellum. Yep. Too. There are a lot of cameras now. So many cameras. How did we uh, resolve that issue? So we updated the observation tool um, so that you can jump between a lot of different gadgets and the gadget families that they are belonging to. So this should make it really easy to jump between all of your uh, team's different gadgets. So this is may on the surface look like a quality of life change because you can cycle through the gadgets, you can uh, have an easier pathway of, of rotating through those. Uh, but it's really a fundamental introduction. It was absolutely necessary to do the change to Echo and to bring Maestro to life. Bring Maestro to life, bring Echo's buff to life exactly. as well. Uh, another change that you may notice in Operation Parabellum is the counter diffuser device is changing. <laughs> uh, so this is a new animation uh, that we're introducing. Why are we doing this uh, animation? Um, mainly because it's a little bit silly that you're smacking a box <laughs> to end it. Um, so this is just something that kind of fits the world a lot better. Yeah, this was on the test server, so it's gonna be a really nice uh, change uh, coming in, in Operation Parabellum. Uh, also coming in Operation Parabellum, we have the Discovery Playlist. The Discovery Playlist is a special customized playlist that allows you to play Villa and only Villa in casual. For four <laughs> weeks at the start of the season, you will be able to play Villa, Villa and only Villa, so you don't have to play. Did you hear that guy? Yeah, he, like, you know, he, really, he screamed. He, uh, he liked screamed that. really loudly there. That's uh, really great to hear the enthusiasm for this, uh, for this ma a new change. Jeremy, you got to be thr thrilled to I just play your map. I'm absolutely thrilled that people can not just go in and play it, and rather than play 10 rounds of house and you know get through, they can just go through, jump casual, and just practice just go practice and learn the map there's a lot to learn so it's i'm, I'm stoked that we have this playlist now yeah it's right. really cool uh I, I i can't wait because i know that's that's been one of the biggest feedback whenever we do launch the season they're like oh i gotta play these these maps and these maps and these maps just to play one round of the new map and now you can just jump right into it and that is going to be available for four weeks at the start of the season and will be available on the test server as well so keep an eye on uh, out on for that the final change, well, not the final change. We have a ton of uh, more changes <laughs> that we can't cover in this panel. Uh, and patch notes will be on, uh, on online on rainbow6.com on uh, Tuesday, May 22nd. But one of the final changes that we're gonna be discussing today is one that we announced at the Six Invitational, which is the map buff for Clubhouse. I know people really love this. Uh, Jeremy, the significance of map buff are huge. Map knowledge in Rainbow Six is huge. So yeah. what, what is the reasoning behind these changes? Basically to bring it up to date, um, to make it more current, to make it more competitive. Wow, they really like this. Um, <laughs> to make it look better and to play better is why we do the map buffs. It's, it's, it, this map is, it was a great map already. It's just so much better now. So much better and it means that it's uh, gonna be interesting to see how the pros adapt, how Every player adapts to that new change coming with Operation Parabellum, and it's becoming a key strategy moving forward as we're going to have more buffs in the future, there will including uh, a, a something that is way bigger than a buff, which is a rework of a map. Yes, there's reworks and buffs. Buffs are, we go through, rearrange the furniture, like, you know, like someone's come around and been drunk and moved your table, is pretty much what a, a, a map buff is. A rework is we actually go through and we completely rework the map from the ground up and basically you see a new map new map if you want more information on all of the things that we talked about right now in this panel head to rainbow6.com and check out some of the dev blogs that we posted
about all of these changes and more. Uh, once again, that is a look at Operation Parabellum. Please give a big round of applause to Alex and Jeremy for running us through it. Operation Parabellum will be available on the test servers starting May 22nd. You do not want to miss out on that. Check it out on May 22nd, and you do not want to miss out on what is coming up just after this, the grand final between Team Liquid and Pepto Sport. Yeah. If I had something to say to the editor, 